Hello, my name is Lisa Shea, and this video series is about horror authors, horror stories, horror poetry, and all things horror. In this particular video, we'll be talking about Under the Influence, which is a short story I've written. It is 13 pages long and 38, 38 words. Some of my stories tend to have a lot of different characters and a complicated scientific plot. In this case, it's sort of complicated because I'm talking about hypnosis and not everyone knows how hypnosis works. So hopefully this video will go into some of the underlying details of it and help make it more clear for the people who didn't quite understand what was going on. So I will be going into a lot of spoilers for this. If you're concerned about spoilers, then I suggest reading the story first. It's only 13 pages. And if you don't mind spoilers, then we'll go ahead and I'll tell you all about the story and what motivated me to write it and some of the details about hypnosis. All right, so this story is primarily about three characters. There's the main character, Karen, who all the things are happening to. There's the doctor who's working with Karen, who's the hypnotist. And then there's Karen's girlfriend. So Karen is just coming out of a hypnosis session with her doctor and her body is pain-free. She is joyful because all of the pain that she had been experiencing up until this point is gone. And she tells Dr. Marcane that uh, she's a marvel. The doctor says, well, we do the best we can. So Karen looks around, she's got the tea at her side, the mahogany desk, and she feels very comfortable here. She's been coming here for two years, and this is the only thing that has been able to take care of the pain that she's dealing with. And it's not easy to keep up with the payments, but it's well worth it because it's helping her be pain-free, at least for little stretches of time. So the doctor tells her to drink lots of fluids, don't overexert yourself. Karen says, can't we do this every day because I like being pain-free? And the doctor says, that's not very healthy for you. We have to do this a week at a time. I know that the pain comes back, but then you know we, we're getting a little better and better each time. So we'll get there. So Karen goes home to her girlfriend, Sarah. Sarah's feeling very desolate because she's been watching her girlfriend be in agonizing pain for two years straight. And that this uh, shyster, which is what Sarah thinks of the doctor, is just giving her little tiny doses of pain-free period and then the pain comes right back. So she's locked her into an eternity of going to the hypnotist. So Sarah's feeling grumpy about it. To be fair, Sarah's been drinking too. So Sarah remembers back to when they used to go hiking and kayaking and everything. And now this hypnotist has turned her girlfriend into a brain dead zombie who has a few moments of pain-free existence and then goes right back to being in pain again. So, they have an argument about this. The general gist is that, you know, maybe the doctor's a shyster, but at least the shyster is doing something that works. No one else has been able to figure anything else at all that even remotely works. So at least there's some pain-free days in here while they try to figure out a more permanent solution. So Karen goes back and is working on her books in her office, but at this point she's just obsessing about the clock because she's in the final moments of her pain-free period and she knows that the pain is going to come back and it's going to be de de debilitating. <laughs> so she's super stressed about the pain coming back. Sarah steps in and is trying to apologize and say, I'm sorry, you know, I, I snap with you. I just feel rough that you're dealing with all of this. But now Karen snaps because Karen knows the pain is coming back and she doesn't want to deal with Sarah anymore. So she drives Sarah off and the pain starts up again. So back at the doctor's office, Karen walks in, says, you're right on time. And Karen says, well, Sarah left. It's just got to be too much between all of the fighting and arguments and everything else. So Karen says, well, this is fine. I can just focus on my recovery. I believe in you, and that's what really matters that I need to get through this. So the doctor brings over Karen's tea, says we're making progress. We're going to uh, keep getting this better and better so you have longer and longer periods of pain-free existence. And they have their session. So Karen's back at home. She's trying to deal with her vitamins and so on. She's starting to realize all of the things that she used to get help with from her girlfriend, and now she has to figure out on her own. But she says that, you know, she's just going to have to figure it out. She's going to focus on the hypnosis. She's going to take better care of her body. And somehow she's going to get through to have a final pain-free existence again. And, and to be fair, it's not like she hasn't been trying anything else. She's been trying acupuncture, massage, heating magnets, heating pads, magnets, going to various doctors, changing her diet. So she's not just relying wholly on the shyster hypnotist to solve her problems. She's trying everything else, but nothing else is working. And at least the hypnotist is able to give her some moments of pain-free time to be able to do anything at all. So 
the doctor brings out some tea and asks her how she's doing. And Karen says, well, I'm doing the best that I can. We could try to do two weeks, uh, two visits a week now that I've got a little more money. And the doctor says, no, that's really not healthy. We have to stick with one visit a week, take this slow and steady and work our way up. So Karen takes a swallow of her tea and says, all right, I suppose that is true. So the doctor counts backwards, but Karen doesn't go under like she normally does. She actually stays conscious. So now she can hear things. Normally when you're doing a hypnosis session, or you know, it depends on the person how a hypnosis session works. But in these particular cases, normally when she did a hypnosis section, she would become unconscious and not hear what was being said consciously. But for some reason today, she does hear all the way down to one and she does hear what's going on after that. So she hears that Dr. Marcane is doing something with clicking noises and now she's calling someone. And it seems to be a guy that has a wife who is a doctor and they're going to have a sex chat. So Karen is really confused and upset by this. I mean, this is supposed to be her therapy time and the entire time up until now for the past two years, she thought that the doctor was spending this time giving her uh, voice uh, commands or commands is the wrong word, suggestions to uh, not feel the pain, the, the, to relax more, and all those kinds of things. But instead, the doctor's sitting there using the time to have sex chats with this guy. So this is concerning to Karen. But she figures maybe she's having a hallucination. So then finally, the doctor's voice comes back again and says, all right, your pain is leaving you. You are pain-free. Everything's going to be just right. And Karen relaxes and says, okay, this is what I was expecting. Who knows what happened before, but we're back to the whole, you're going to be pain-free. And then the doctor says, listen carefully. For this week, you'll go 37 hours while feeling normal. And then at the 37th hour, the pain and agony will come back and it will persist until you come back into this room until you hear my voice again. My voice is the only sound which will remove the pain from you. So the doctor is implanting into her mind the idea that she is going to have pain and there's not going to be any way to get rid of the pain until she comes back and hears her voice again. So... I'm going to digress for a minute about the nature of hypnosis. And I have several friends who are hypnotists and I have undergone hypnosis. Hypnosis isn't controlling a person through voice or speech or anything like that. It's helping the person get a better handle on controlling themselves. So it's the same sort of thing as meditation or some forms of religion. It's training your brain to act more in a way that you would wish for it to act. So, I mean, you could say that hypnosis controls you in the same way that practicing the piano controls you to play the piano better. It's not that it's a controlling thing. It's that you're doing some training and you're doing it on purpose to try to train your way to behave in a certain way. And the concept of training your brain to handle pain differently is a very well studied and um, scientifically valid thing that can happen. So you could train yourself to ignore certain pain signals. So if you had, I don't know, a stabbing pain in your finger because of some childhood accident or something, and there isn't anything actually wrong in your finger, it's just that a nerve ending is damaged or something like that, then you could train yourself to ignore the stabbing pain signal over time. And that way, when that signal comes through, your brain just knows to not pay attention to it because it's not something important. So this is something you have to be really cautious about because let's say that you trained yourself not to pay attention to pain signals coming from your finger. It could be that you actually cut your finger or hurt your finger, and now you've trained yourself not to pay attention to those signals and you could have some sort of a serious infection and not be aware of it. So people who do this have to be very cautious about how they do it to make sure that they ignore pain signals that they know are not useful to them, but are still aware of pain signals that are telling them something new and that they have to be aware of. So hypnosis does work. Um, in general, your brain has to be open to the process of hypno hypnosis. It's, it's very hard to hypnotize someone against their will. And generally, the purpose of hypnosis is to help a person do something that they want to do and they just need a little support with. So uh, not smoking or not eating unhealthy foods or that kind of thing. Things that we know we want to do or not do and that we need some help getting practice learning to do it. And the hypnotist isn't actually ac acting as a life coach. So it's just the same as uh, having a trainer in a gym. Maybe if you went into a gym on your own, you say, oh, I'm not in the mood to use the bike machine today. 
But if you have a trainer there that's sitting next to you and say, okay, it's time to use the bike machine, you might be more likely to use the bike machine, maybe in part because you paid the person <laughs> and you've put money into this project and you want to get a reward. So there's all sorts of complicated reasons and motivations that these things tend to work better for some people than just yourself saying, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do stuff for half an hour. You know, sometimes having a person there, a coach there, giving you support and encouragement makes a difference to how well you follow through on it. So to go back to the story, it's in this particular case, the doctor is influencing her to say that she's going to have pain. And this might not have worked if Karen wasn't already thinking that she was going to have pain. So it's not like the doctor is putting a super strange idea in her head, like your body's going to turn yellow. She's saying you are going to have pain again, which is what Karen expects is going to happen. So it's just sort of reinforcing to her, yes, you are going to have pain again. And this is all happening subconsciously, normally. In this particular case, Karen has been aware for it and um, was able to hear it. But normally this has been happening subconsciously. So it was just going into her mind without uh, conscious thought, trying to block it. So Karen realizes that the doctor has been giving her uh, messages saying that she'll be pain-free for a certain portion of time and then the pain will come back, meaning that the doctor could just as easily <laughs> have said you're going to be pain-free for the entire week, at which point the doctor wouldn't get paid anymore, so the doctor doesn't have a lot of incentive to have that happen. So the Karen realizes what is going on and she thinks about, well, why am was I painful in the first place? And she realizes that she'd been out drinking because she had a fight with Sarah. And she'd rear-ended another car who stopped short at a light. And since she was drinking and since she was the one who hit from behind, the guy had been nice about it. The guy had suggested that she see the doctor. And he said that his wife was a doctor. So that ties into the person that the, do the doctor has been having these sex chats with. So it seems like the guy and Dr. Marquine are in this together that the guy causes accidents by stopping short in front of people and then suggests that they're going to be in pain soon, that the pain's going to arrive gradually. So to get ahead of it, that the person should go and talk to Dr. Marquine and start sessions to be able to get a grip on the pain before it gets too nasty. So she hadn't been in pain before she went to see Dr. Marquine. She had just assumed that she was going to soon be in pain. And then when she went to see the doctor, the doctor said, yes, you're going to have pain. So she was reinforcing something that the patient already thought was going to happen. So the doctor gets her to wake up. Karen says, wait a minute, you were talking to someone on the phone. Doctor says, oh, you've been having hallucinations. These things happen. And then the doctor looks at the T and says, maybe you're having a reaction to the tea. And Karen realizes that the tea is actually drugging her. So the doctor is putting her unconscious for an hour so that the doctor can have her sex chat time. And then only at the very end does the doctor actually give her a suggestion, which reinforces the fact that she's going to have pain, which the patient already thought was going to happen, and then reinforces that there's going to be a period of non-pain, which also the patient thinks is going to happen, because that's the whole reason that the patient's going to Dr. McCain. So the patient says, I see what's going on here. You are giving me pain and you are taking away the pain. And then the doctor says, well, <laughs> if you really think this is all fake, then we could just skip a session. And Karen said, well, but that wouldn't help because now you've embedded into me the thought that I'm going to be pain-free until you talk with me again. So if I go and miss a session, I'm just going to be in agonizing pain until you talk to me again. I want you to tell me <laughs> that I'm not going to be in pain so that I don't have this happen anymore. And the doctor says, well, I think you're just hallucinating. I can't do that to you. <laughs> so Karen says, I'll tell other doctors. And she's like, yeah, prove it. <laughs> so she said, well, I'll record you. She said, you know what? Go ahead. Record me. You can record exactly what I say to you. And uh, Karen realizes that undoubtedly for the recording session, somehow the recording would be phrased in a way that it didn't seem suspicious and she could try to keep recording her forever, but who knows, maybe it would be just even worse pain because now the doctor wouldn't be doing her normal script that the doctor could easily just say, well, I think you're not focused enough this week. I guess you're going to be in agonizing pain for the week and make things even worse. So the doctor says your next appointment set up. I'll see you in a week. And Karen stalks off because she just doesn't even know what to do. 
So then we skip to three days later. It's just been agonizing pain. She's gone to every doctor. She's trying to find another way out of this. The doctors have run every test. There is nothing that they can do. Uh, she even tries calling Sarah. Sarah said, <laughs> this is ridiculous. I've given up on you. Best of luck. So Karen went to an acupuncturist. She tried, tried drinking to drown her pain and nothing works. She is just violently ill. She's in stabbing pain. It's come around to the doctor's appointment again and she has no other choice. There's no physical way to solve it because it's all in her mind in essence. And she's not able to convince her mind that she can be pain-free without the doctor because she has become at some sub subconscious level so convinced that the doctor is the only way that she can escape from her pain. So she's staring at the button to call an Uber to go back to the doctor again and finally she just gives in and says, you know, I don't care. She's taking advantage of me, but at least it's some break from this pain that I'm suffering. So it ends with her just being a trapped victim of the doctor. She's going to have to go back every week. She knows that the doctor is using her and abusing her, but there's no way around it. If the doctor will not release her, then every time a session ends, the doctor is just going to put another qualification on it. And since she's being told at the end of each session that she's going to be in pain after a certain amount of time, there's no way to get around that. She's just going to be a pain. And you, you know, she'd have to find another hypnotist that was able to break the spell, but the chance of that happening, at least in her mind, is slim. And since it's her own mind we're talking about, since she believes that it couldn't happen, then it can't happen because it's her own mind that's controlling the pain or the not pain that's happening to her. So I suppose to summarize about the hypnosis side, it's not that people are controlling you or programming you or anything like that, they are trying to encourage or discourage your mind from heading in a certain direction. And we could do it ourselves. I mean, if we sat down and we meditated every day and we trained ourselves to do things, we could train ourselves to make better food choices or to avoid alcohol or to stop smoking or all these things that we would hope for. But many people don't have the uh, perseverance to sit down and do that, or maybe they don't have the time to do it for an hour every day, or maybe they don't know how to approach it, or they don't know what YouTube channels to watch, or, you know, there's all sorts of different reasons that people do not want to attempt this sort of thing on their own. And if you go to a hypnotist, it's like going to a, uh, a life coach, I'll say again. It's someone who knows the techniques and could help guide you through it to help you get to a better space. And the hope would be once you learn the techniques that you could then do it on your own. You should never be locked into having to go to a hypnotist. Unless, you know, some people just, you know, why do people go and get their nails painted once a week when you could easily sit down with your own bottle of nail polish and do it? Sometimes it's just nice to interact with another person who cares about you and to do something that feels good and has someone um, paying attention to you. So it could certainly be that just the act of going to talk with the hypnotist and knowing that someone cares about the things you're going through and is listening to the things and giving you feedback and so on is a useful part of the process. So all of those things factor in here. So let me know if you have any questions about hypnosis or about the uh, thoughts behind the storyline and the characters involved in it. Uh, you can comment if you have questions and I'll get back to you. Or you can use my other social media, Facebook, Twitter, that's all fine. Uh, please like and subscribe to this channel, and I look forward to talking to you soon.